take a Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 5, or you can use one of the Bibles located in front of you in your seat. John chapter 5, we want to continue the Who is Jesus series. We're going through the fifth chapter of this Gospel, and we are looking at the words and the acts of Jesus, and we are answering the question that was, that was asked in this fifth chapter in verse 12, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? Because there's obviously a lot of confusion about this. Now, last time we were in John 5, we saw that Jesus is the one who helps the helpless. And today, we are going to see clearly Jesus is the one who is equal with God. Now, it's important as we're starting to say that there has been a lot of confusion about the question, who is Jesus, over the years. In fact, it started as soon as he came into this world. We're told that in the Gospels, because of the bitter jealousy and rivalry of the religious leaders of his day, they insinuated in John 8, Jesus was born of an illegitimate birth instead of being virgin born. They said in Matthew 13, he was simply the carpenter's son, as if he was not who he claimed to be. They called him a very racially charged term in John chapter 8. They called him a Samaritan which in that first century culture was a very racist and bigoted slur spoken against Jesus. In chapter 7 and 8 of this book and in Matthew 12, we are told that they could not deny the power of Jesus, so instead they attributed his power to demons and to Satan and even Beelzebub, the prince, the lord of demons. And They were very clear in attacking his person and character time and time again. In fact, it got so bad one time in chapter 10 of John, they even said Jesus was insane. And this has obviously led to many people today saying the very same things about Jesus. Not much has really changed. There are many people because of hatred or distrust or because of the way his followers, professing followers, have lived, have said the very same kind of attacks and slurs against him. When reading history, I came across a charge against Jesus made. It was recorded in the second century. It's in the Jewish Talmud. But it was actually made while he walked the earth. This was the arrest warrant for Jesus. And it's recorded by the Jewish people, verifying, authenticating. He was a real literal historical person who lived. And it says, wanted Yeshu HaNazari, or wanted Jesus the Nazarene. And this is what it says. It says, he shall be stoned because he has practiced sorcery. He has enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf Anyone who knows where he is, let him come to the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And we know that one did come forward, a man named Judas, and betrayed Jesus. And so there's always been this question, who is he? And really in particular, is he who he says he is? I found another source from history that it's worth sharing today. It was from the emperor of Rome, Julian, A.D. 361 to 363, someone in there. He writes these words. He says, Jesus has been celebrated now for about 300 years, having done nothing in his lifetime worthy of fame unless anyone thinks it's a very great work to heal lame and blind people and exercise demoniacs in villages of Bethsaida and Bethany, unquote. This is the attitude of the Roman emperor. In the 70s in America, Jesus was the ultimate superstar, right? When the Da Vinci Code came out, he was a cult leader, married to Mary Magdalene. Atheists say he is a monument to the stupidity of Christians. He is often, to many professing followers of God, a good luck charm or a cosmic 911 operator that we can turn to only in our most distressing moments when it is convenient for us. Many people have taken the very liberal view of Jesus that was expressed in the 20th and 19th century in particular, that Jesus was an example for faith, but not the object of faith. He was a good moral teacher and leader, but he was not who he claimed he was. Yesterday, a group of us from the church were out walking some neighborhoods, and we were praying For those we came in contact with, we were giving out flyers, we had Bibles, we gave out many Bibles throughout the day, inviting people to church, introducing ourselves. And as we were walking, 
we saw another man out at about 9.30 in the morning walking towards us. He was in a suit and tie. I immediately supposed he was probably out selling carpet cleaners or uh, had something that he had for sale. But we went and introduced ourselves, and we went to invite him to church and speak to him. Come to find out, he was actually a Jehovah's Witness. And you have to be either really gung-ho for what you believe or really crazy to be walking around neighborhoods at 930 when it's like 35 degrees outside and the wind is whipping. And so um, he's out there, we're out there, we introduce ourselves, we start talking. And I was thinking about how sad that conversation was, that we have... Two groups of people, one man and then the group from our church, were out essentially in the world's eyes doing the same thing. We're inviting people to come, we're praying, and, and we're concerned about those around us. But our messages could not be more fundamentally different. And this is not just a difference that matters for that Saturday or for what church you go to on Sunday. It is a difference that matters for your entire life and the life to come. Because when Jehovah's Witnesses answer the question, who is Jesus, they say Jesus was Michael the archangel. They say that Jesus was a God, but not the God. They say that Jesus will always be under Yahweh, Jehovah, that Jesus should never be prayed to, that Jesus should never be worshipped, and that he is not co-equal with God. In other words, we have two radically different answers to this question. And your eternal destiny matters on your correct understanding. Ironically, all these people want to know who is Jesus and try to answer the question, but they never or very seldom seem to go to his own testimony of what he said about himself. And as we read these verses, I'm not going to shun from the fact this is some of the most deep and solemn words we will find in the New Testament. Some of the heaviest words, subjects like Jesus' divine nature, that Jesus is co-equal with God, His unity with God the Father. We must confess our weakness and say at the beginning of this, as we read these verses, that like the psalmist says in 139.6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot contain it. We can only begin to just believe as children by faith the words we read today. And so I pray you will come as a little child before the throne of Christ today and that he would speak to our hearts and we would see that Jesus is God, that Jesus equals God. Join me as we read together John 5. We'll pick up where we left off in verse 16. The Bible says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment or condemnation, but has passed from death into life. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would still our hearts that right now we would see the utmost importance of the word of Christ. And that today, oh Jesus, you would reveal yourself to everyone that is here by the power of your spirit, that we would see clearly that you are the one who gives mercy, but that you are also the great judge. You are the God over all, the Lord, creator, and sustainer of this world. And I ask that this would not be an academic exercise, that we would not just get information but Lord, that this would be a time of worship, 
that we would see you and hear you for who you are, and we would fall before you and say, you are worthy, O Lord. O Lord, work here today in our hearts, deep inside, we ask in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Verse 16 gives us the context. The religious leaders called the Jews are angry with Jesus because in the last 15 verses, in our last time together, we saw he pursued a man who was friendless, who was helpless, who for 38 years had been sick with a very serious condition, a man who was hopeless, and Jesus pursued this man, and not only did he heal him on the Sabbath day, show mercy to this man. See, God doesn't help those who help themselves. God who helps those who can't help themselves, and he shows he's God by doing this. And then he tells this man to arise and to walk and take up his bed, his mat. And the religious leaders were not too happy. Because all they cared about was not the mercy and compassion and love of God. All they cared about was their laws and their rules and their stipulations. It's sad because the Bible is clear. What are the greatest commands? To love the Lord your God supremely. Number two, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was doing this when he healed this man in this act of worship and praise on the Sabbath day. But they didn't care about God or this man. They cared about their rules, their way of doing church, if you will, their stipulations. And so, we are told they began to persecute him, and they even sought to kill him. Those two verbs are in what's called the imperfect tense, meaning that from this time forward, they begin to persecute, to harass, to deliberately pursue Jesus with anger and bitterness and hatred. In fact, it's a while after this miracle that we read in John chapter 7, Jesus speaking to a different group of religious leaders. And he says that you are angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well. In other words, they were still angry. And they were angry two years later with him about this when they crucified him. So that's the context. He's being opposed He's being not only opposed, but really being persecuted and hated by the religious leaders. And this is why he begins to defend and explain why he has the right and authority to do what he does here. And these words cannot be missed. We could read over them. We could gloss them because they're not necessarily easy words. But if you miss them, you miss why he did the miracle. If you miss him, you miss why Jesus should be worshipped. If you don't understand these words, you really don't understand the Christian faith. And so why these words are deep and too wonderful for us, while these words, really human words, can't even begin to help us really fathom what is being said here, yet Jesus has given them to us because he loves us and he wants us to know him and understand him. So we see, first off, Number one, very clearly in verses 17 and 18, Jesus is equal with God in nature. This is huge to understand. Jesus is equal with God in nature. Now, this is not supposed to be confusing, though it often is. Some of you have seen on Facebook and Twitter and all the social media feeds, Common Core Math. Who's seen Common Core Math? It's a little confusing, right? Um, I don't, someone needs to go back and learn to take a logic class, right? Because something's missing there. And I've got teachers in our congregation and around us that are saying, I'm not getting this thing because it doesn't make sense. Well, the way you learned the word equal, you remember the equal sign you learned in like kindergarten and first grade? It's that simple what we're going to read here. Jesus equals God in nature, in his nature, in his being. Look at these verses again. It, it, it's not supposed to be confusing, but we are so prone to mess this up. Jesus answered them, My father has been working unto now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now it's important to understand, the Jewish people in the first century were praying people. They always have been. And it was not uncommon for them to pray to God as father, as we do today. But when they would pray to him as father, they would pray in a very general way. We are all children of God by creation, by nature. And they would say, our father, as we often pray, because Jesus told us in the Lord's Prayer, pray in this way, our father in heaven, right? But there's something special about what Jesus says here that we can't gloss over and miss. Jesus doesn't say, 
our Father. He says here, personal, possessive, my Father. My Father. He is claiming something very exclusive about his relationship to God. He is my Father. This is the same idea that we find in probably the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3.16. God in this way loved the world. He gave his one and only, or his begotten Son. Now, the Greek word there that is used simply means his unique son. The NIV translates it trying to help us understand the one and only son of God. Now, by the work of Christ on the cross, he adopts us into his family, and we become daughters of God, sons of the living God. That's one of the great hopes of the Bible. But we are children of God by adoption and by grace. Jesus is not the Son of God by adoption or grace. He is the Son of God by nature. He is the unique Son, different from you who are a daughter of God, you who are a Son of God. In fact, theologians often say that Jesus is our elder brother, and that's expressed in the Bible as well, that we are the children of God, but He's the elder brother because He is God's Son by nature. Now, when you read this here, my Father has been working until now, this would be a crazy claim to a Jewish leader in the first century. They knew the Old Testament well. They knew what the Bible taught. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, to who will you compare me that I should be like him as the Holy One? In fact, this is why Adam and Eve were driven from paradise, right? They were driven from the Garden of Eden because Satan said, you will be like God. And then Satan was thrown from heaven because he said, I will be like the most high. And for you to claim that you are the direct, only unique son of God makes you equal with him as his son. This is a huge statement that's being made here. And yet the son of man has the nature of a man. Jesus is 100% man, but he is also 100% God. And God is his father, unlike he is our father. A very special relationship. And he says, my father has been working until now. Now, this is the basis of contention here, the Sabbath day. Jesus shows mercy on the Sabbath. He heals this man who went through 38 winters, 38 summers, not able to walk, weak. He went through 38 years friendless. 38 years, all the money he threw at his sickness, none of it could bring healing to it. 38 years of loneliness and isolation and suffering, just a number in the crowd. Some of you feel that way today. And yet Jesus sought this man, chose this man, pursued this man, and did everything for this man that no one else could do. And that was the point of contention. He did this thing on the Sabbath day. And Jesus is saying, look, my father has been working on the Sabbath day until now. Now, when you go back and you read the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that's in them, and then he rests on the seventh day. Now, very important, Jesus, God as creator, doesn't rest from being God. God doesn't stop being God on that day. The Hebrew word Shabbat that's used there has the idea of rest. It's where we get our word Sabbath from. It has the idea of ceasing from the creation that he was doing. But he did not cease his working as God. Now, even the rabbis in that day understood this. In fact, one time, four rabbis were brought to Rome, and they were brought and convened before the Roman emperor, and they were uh, brought before him because he wanted to understand the Sabbath. He thought it was kind of a foolish idea. How could you say that one of the gods, because they were polytheists in those days, how could you say that one of the gods would rest? And this is what the rabbis came up with. They said, quote, God carried no load outside the limits of his own dwelling, which is heaven and earth. And he lifted nothing to a height which exceeded his own stature in heaven on the Sabbath. And that was their way to kind of explain that while God stopped working in creation, he was still taking care of his creation on the Sabbath day. And and here's the point. We are told in the Bible, and this is such a, a wonderful hope for you and for me, that the God of Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. He never rests from what he's doing. We are told in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 40, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. Now look, some of you have called me before at 2 a.m. And I promise on a normal sane day at 2 a.m., I am in bed sleeping, right? And 
There are people that are out there all hours of the night doing things, but everyone's got to rest at some point, correct? But God and his care over his creation is always available. He's available early in the morning. He's available late at night. He's available at noon. He's available in the middle of the night because he never rests from being God and doing what God does. So we have to begin to ask, what does God do? Well, bottom line, the laws of nature take no holiday, do they? The grass still grows on the Sabbath day, on Saturday. If you cut your finger, your finger begins the clotting and the healing process on that day. The earth still rotates on that day. The sun still rises and sets. In fact, this is called God's providential, his governing care of the world. And it's always going on at all times. In fact, if for a split second God stopped upholding this world, this world would not be. It would cease to exist. This is huge. There was an pr early preacher in the church named Chrysostom, and he was preaching on this verse. And this is what he said. He said, God cares for and holds together everything that has been made. When you see the sun rising, the moon running in the path, the lakes, the fountains, the rivers, the rains, the course of nature in a seed, in our own bodies and in the bodies of the irrational, the animals and such, and all the rest by which the universe is made up, we learn the ceaseless working of the Father. Jesus is saying, look, I don't break the Sabbath by showing mercy and saving this man any more than God breaks his law by allowing you to wake up in the morning, allowing the oxygen to keep revolving in the world, allowing the sun to shine today. God is not breaking his law any more than I am. He says, I have been working just as the Father has been working. Now, the Sabbath is an important principle. Some of us are not at all in danger of, this, of breaking the Sabbath, okay? Um, some of us are very much in danger of having too much Sabbath in the world, right? And, and all we do, it seems, is we, life's a beach for some of us, right? And we literally live in Pensacola, and we're, we're good at the resting thing. We've got that down. But then there, there's a temptation on the other side for a lot of us that, uh, we are the 24-7 people. This is a, a hard problem for pastors often. We're always on the go, and it's hard to just rest and sit. And that's why we have time in our services where we're just quiet, and we let you pray and, and speak to the Lord and let God speak deep into your heart because I think that's important. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Look, if you don't come apart and rest, you will simply come apart one day. But the difference here is that Jesus is God, and he is working lock and step with the Father. He says, this is my Father, and he gives a lot of examples of this throughout the Bible about how it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. It's okay to show mercy. He talks about David and how David went into the tabernacle and he ate the, the showbread at the tabernacle on the Sabbath day, or how the priests work in the temple like a pastor, spends time on the Lord's Day preaching and counseling and these kind of things, and how if a person, their ox, or you say your pet dog was injured, right, on the Sabbath day, or for those of you who are cat lovers, you weird people, your cats, right, um, you would want to help it, right? You'd want to take care of it. You would care about your animal if it was injured. Jesus gives the illustration of an ox falling into a pit. You would pull it out of the pit because you care about it. You wouldn't let it sit there and suffer all day and all night. And in the same way, he says that he is working, and he is working with his Father in this way. And I want you to notice how the Jewish people, the religious leaders in verse 18 heard this. It says, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, their view of the Sabbath, but he said God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now, it's important to say here, and if you're not a Christian, I'm glad you're here today. Thank you for being with us. But the way the Jewish leaders heard what Jesus said was very different than the way most non-Christians would hear what Jesus just said. The way he heard and interpreted, they interpreted these words is different than the way a Muslim would hear these words, or a Jehovah's Witness, for that matter, would hear these words, or a Mormon would hear these words. Because when they heard it, they heard it as God intended. If what Jesus just said is not true, it is blasphemy. And if it is true, we should worship him. In fact, we could say it another way. His whole life, all the way to the cross, was arguing this very point, that Jesus equals God. 
Jesus did not die on the cross because he was a martyr or because he was a great teacher or because he did not have power to stop the forces against him. Jesus died on the cross because he is God and because God loves us. He died, and he was asked right before he died by Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? Are you God? He was asked. He said, I am, right? Are you the son of God? I am. The word equal here refers to equal in number, size, quality, and characteristics. There's no one here who would say I'm equal with God who has any sense in this room, right? There's a lot of people that try to live that way, but they eventually slow down, don't they? Or something slows them down. Yet, he's equal with God. I want you just to hear. Just, just allow God to speak into your life these truths for a second here. I know this is deep, but just hear it. John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, whoever has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father above. 1 Timothy 3, 16, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God came in the flesh. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord is going to give you a sign. A virgin is going to conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Titus 2, 13, we are waiting for a blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to this earth just as a man. He was 100% man, yes, but he was also 100% God. And the reason why people love the, the holiday of Christmas so much, because they like to think of God as a quaint little baby in a manger, and they leave Jesus there, very irrelevant, for 365 days till the next Christmas, where they put him back in the manger again, right? But the fact of the matter is, he was a man. He was a baby in the flesh. He did humble himself, but he grew, and he showed he was God, and he's coming back one day as God to make this world right. That's our Lord. He's equal with God in nature. Secondly, he's equal with God in power. We're going to see that in the next few verses. Look at verses 19 to 21. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son. He shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, from verses 19 on, for the rest of our time in this series through John 5, Jesus is going to be answering this charge of he's claiming to be equal with God, calling God my Father. He's going to be answering. And some people believe that this was almost like a trial. And all the religious leaders had kind of gathered around him, and he's giving his formal defense. But I want to tell you something. Jesus wants you to understand these words too. He wants you to get them. And, and I think that while they are very profound words and very powerful words, they are words that he gives that a child needs to understand just as much as a great theologian. Because that's who God is, right? God loves a little one as much as he loves the aged and wise, right? And he gives these words here and he says, you can't come into the kingdom. You can't be mine unless you enter as a little child. And yet he also says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways even past our understanding. They're so high, who can even contain them? And so we worship God. And anyone who says, I understand every single phrase and adjective and verb in these next few verses, look, you tried to figure it out. God, that's a big problem, isn't it? You cannot put God in a box, but you can worship God our God who reveals himself in this way. And so look with me at what he says here. He begins and he says, most assuredly. That's how the new King James renders it. Some of your translations, the old King James said, verily, verily. Most translations say truly, truly. When he makes a statement, he is making a statement of utmost importance. He's saying, don't miss this. If it was modern English, don't miss what I'm about to say to you. You can count on this statement. This has great weight behind it. 
This is something you cannot miss. Truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. Well, you could just read that and think that Jesus is not God, that Jesus is not who he claims to be because he can do nothing of himself. And a lot of people would run with the statement and say that, but you have to read the whole context of what he's saying. He is not telling us that he is limited in his power. He is telling us he is equal with God in power. He doesn't do anything by himself because he's one with God in heaven. And what he does, God does. And what God does, he does because he is God. Now, you might be confused after hearing all that. And that's when you, this whole, this whole faith thing steps in, right? And you say, is Jesus God? Yes. Is the Father God? Yes. Are they one? Yes. But are they two different persons? Yes. And you say, explain that to me, pastor. I say, no, you just believe that and you fall down and worship him. Because this is amazing stuff. This is deep. Too high for my mind. But gloriously true. So, the son can do nothing of himself. This is sonship. This is not submission by coercion or because he's weaker or inferior. This is a son who loves the father as the father loves the son. Jesus is not the slave of God. Jesus does not lack the power of God. Jesus has the very same power of God. In fact, he says here, the son also does what he sees in the father in like manner. In other words, very important to point this out. Jesus sees what the Father does. Jesus sees what you and I can't see. When that man was sitting there 38 years, no one told Jesus, Jesus, that guy really could use your help. He's been able to walk for 38 years. No one will take him and put him in the pool of Bethesda. No one told Jesus that. He knew. When, when these religious leaders had this hatred bubbling up in their heart, Jesus didn't need someone to tell him that. In fact, many times in the Bible, Jesus answers questions that were never asked out loud, right? Because he sees what's going on inside of us, though we've never vocalized them. And he sees what the Father is doing that we don't see. Right now, we don't see the spiritual war that's going on around us. Right now, we don't know what the will of God is for our lives. Right now, we don't know what tomorrow holds. But we know someone who does. Right now, we don't understand. Look, uh, scientists in every branch of science have made these amazing discoveries, and, and we should marvel at them. In fact, we're going to run a bulletin insert in a few weeks. It was run uh, recently. Eric Metaxas wrote it. Uh, it was an article. It was a WSJ article. Is modern science proving or pointing to the existence of God? I encourage you to read that article. It's great. It'll be in the bulletin, I think, next week. But look, friends, listen. They're going to keep pursuing their fields of study. But you know what? There's always going to come a point where there is going to be a limit that they're not going to be able to surpass, right? And they're going to have to say at some point what? We don't know. I don't know. We just believe it because it happens. It's working, but we don't understand it. I love it when I see documentaries by evolutionists. In fact, my favorite one ever is one where... They were a biologist was dissecting, working on a dead giraffe and was working on the, the breathing system, the, the lungs as well as the heart and the way blood pumps up through the giraffe and to the brain and then the oxygen goes and, and works in a very unique and splendid manner that I can't surely begin to describe with you today. That's not my field of study, but uh, listening to these intellectuals describe it and all of a sudden... It, well, I don't know if we want to call it a Freudian slip, but for better, or for not knowing a better term, a Freudian slip happens. The scientist says, it is amazing how this giraffe was created because he should pass out every time he breathes because there's such a distance from the lungs to the head. It is amazing how this giraffe was designed. And then he realized he slipped. You can't have a designer if you're an evolutionist, right? It all happened by chance, correct? Primordial soup was brewing out there one day, and everything came from that. And they all started laughing because they couldn't help but laugh at themselves because he made a mistake. You know, there comes a point where there are things going on around us that are unseen, that are unheard, but God is at work. 
Billy Graham in a classic sermon in the 50s said, it's like the wind. You can look and you cannot see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You can feel the wind, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And Billy Graham, great preaching. He got it from Jesus in John chapter 3. All right? It's faith. God's at working and the son knows. Look, God, Jesus knows right now what God is speaking into your heart. He knows what God's will is for your life. He knows things that you don't know, I don't know, but he knows. And it says, secondly here, the son also does it in like manner. In other words, his acts are not independent acts. They are also acts of the father. What he does, the father does. What the father does, the son does. In fact, this is what Jesus says in John 17, 21. His prayer is, God, I pray that the church, my people, would be one just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. So if God is almighty, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, if God is infinite in all of his attributes or his perfections, so is Jesus, because they can do the same things. In fact, Augustine, the church father, made this great statement. He said, if the Son can do the same things, and in like manner as the Father, let the Jew be silenced, the Christian believe, the heretic be convinced, the Son is equal with the Father. If Jesus can do what the Father does, and the Father does what Jesus does, they must be one. They must be one. Verse 20 continues, and it's important to say all the verbs here are in the present tense. The Father loves the Son. We know that. That was already affirmed in John chapter 3. This unity of love. This is not just the love of a parent and child. This is an eternal relationship. Before this world was created, Jesus was there. That's how this gospel starts. Jesus didn't come into existence 2,000 years ago. He's always been God. And we are told here, the Father loves the Son, and He shows Him all things that He Himself does, and the Son will do greater works than even what you've seen so far. Amazing. Now, God the Father is not showing the Son like the Son is an ignorant student. This is talking about the secret things of God. Deuteronomy 29 tells us a very important thing. The Bible teaches us that we are all slightly agnostic. You say, no, I'm a Christian. Well, you are a Christian. But even Christians are agnostic in some things. God has not told us everything. He's not given us all knowledge, has he? So if you're one of those weird people that contemplate when a, when a tree breaks out in the woods by itself, does it make a sound or not, get a life, okay? <laughs> um, there's some things that God has not revealed to us. He has chosen not to reveal, right? The secret things belong to the Lord, Deuteronomy 29 says, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children. There is no secret thing to Jesus. He knows everything. There's nothing hidden from his sight. The Father has given him all knowledge. He knows all, shows him all. And greater works are coming. Look, if you're amazed that Jesus would love this hurting, hopeless, friendless man who for 38 years had suffered, if you're amazed at that work of healing, greater things are coming than that. Verse 21 says, he is going to raise the dead and even give life to them. Again, this would astonish the Jew. The Jew knows that only one person can bring life from death. Only one person can grant life, and that is God the Father. And yet, this is going to be something greater than the healing of this lame man in chapter 5. Jesus is going to raise dead people and make them alive. He's going to say, Lazarus, who had been in the ground days, and who everyone said, Lazarus stinks. He's going to say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus will arise and come out of that tomb. Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 will see the ruler weeping because his daughter has been dead. And Jesus is going to go and take this dead girl's hand and he's going to say, arise, and the girl will arise. In, Matthew, in Luke chapter 7, there will be a poor weeping widow whose son has died. And we are told that as they were carrying his body on the stretcher, that Jesus said, young man, I say to you, arise. And this man got up and he was alive. Look, no one does that but God. Guys on television don't do that. They don't. But God does. Now, you say, what does this mean, pastor? What does this mean to me? He gives life to them. He says to the sister of Lazarus in that occurrence, 
I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You see, Jesus raised people from the grave, and then he did the ultimate work. He was raised from the grave himself to tell us something, that he doesn't want us to stay dead in our sins. He doesn't want our sins to have control over us. He wants to give us life. Some of you feel dead this morning. You feel like you pray and your prayers don't get to God. They get kind of stuck in the ceiling tiles somewhere. Sometimes you can't even get them out of your mouth. Some of you feel like there's no hope this morning. And look, Christ is saying here, my Father is going to do greater things in me than just this. I'm going to be raised from the dead, and I'm going to raise people who are sinners, who are lost, who are hopeless. I'm going to take them from spiritual death and move them to spiritual life. That's the greater thing. That's a miracle. People want miracles all the time. They're like, God, I want to see a sign. I want to see a sign. The greatest miracle of all is every time a dead sinner who is bound by their hopelessness and their guilt and their pain is resurrected and their eyes are opened and their heart is alive and they can love and follow Jesus. That is the greatest miracle of all. It's called the new birth. Now, very important, he says the son will give life to whom he will. He's equal with God in power. Only God can give life and Jesus is sovereign and he calls us and he gives us life. We are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, John says, but of God. It's God who does this. But then thirdly, we wrap this up. He's equal with God in authority. He's equal with God in authority. The Father judges no one. He's committed all judgment to the Son, all rule to the Son. You see, again, a lot of people have this idea of Jesus that he's just this cosmic 911 operator. Meek and lowly Jesus, we call on him when we're in need, and he might answer the call. Faithful Jesus, he might be there in our time of trouble. But we forget that right now, the Bible says in Hebrews, he is the ruler. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Again, if Jesus was not sustaining this world and causing what we call mother nature, and by the way, some of you need to be much more worried about Father God than you need to be worried about mother nature in here. I'm just saying. But what we call mother nature, that's Jesus upholding everything controlling everything. There is not a single square inch in this universe that he does not cry, it is mine, and have lordship and authority over his God. And we read here all judgment. We often think of this and we just think of Jesus as a judge on the last day, but the fact is Jesus today is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God. And if we call upon him, he is faithful to answer us and show us great and mighty things. He can do far more than we could ever ask or think by his power alone. That's the kind of God we have. Now, we're out of time, but I just want to read verses 23 and 24 and make a few comments and we will worship with the Lord's table. All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Again, most assuredly, truly, truly, verily, verily, in Greek, amen, amen, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. They will not come into judgment or condemnation. They have passed from death into life. Look, verse 23, I could preach a whole sermon on and spend an hour, and we wouldn't even have scratched the surface, so... This is the, the quick version, okay? What is he saying here? All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. The religious leaders in the first century are saying, what? Isaiah, the prophet, recorded the, war, the Lord speaking, and he said, I am the Lord, there is no other. Jeremiah 17, the prophet there said, cursed is he who trusts in man, whose heart is turned away from the Lord. And yet Jesus is saying here, if you honor God, you have to honor me. I deserve the same honor that the Father in heaven deserves. This, in effect, is saying something very important here, something that Buddhism doesn't teach. Buddhism says Jesus was simply a wise and enlightened man who taught similar things to the Buddha. Christian science, which is not Christian nor not science, it's kind of like grape nuts the cereal. There's no grapes and there's no nuts in it. Christian science says that Jesus was just a man who came to teach humanity and heal. Hinduism says Jesus could have been a god or a man, but he was more akin to a Krishna, a wise man. 
Islam says Jesus was a man, a true prophet sent by God, surpassed, superseded by a greater prophet, Muhammad. Jehovah's Witnesses says that Jesus was the first of God's creation, that before he came into the world, he was Michael the archangel. He should not be prayed to or worshipped. Unitarian Universalists say Jesus was a great teacher, a faith healer, the incarnation of God's love, who came to demonstrate love for humanity. All these claim to worship God, some form of a, of a God, but they do not worship Jesus. And Jesus is saying the very opposite. If you worship the Father, you must worship me. The hand that was nailed on the cross is the almighty hand of God. The hand that comes down and rescues us from our sins is the hand of Almighty God. You see, the idea of the fatherhood of God outside of Jesus is a superstition. It's an invention of man. You can't go to the Father but through the Father's Son, Jesus, who is also God. You can't do it. It's impossible. So this ends. Truly, truly, most assuredly, don't miss this, Jesus is saying. Please hear this. I say this to you. Hear my words. My word has power. It was his word when he spoke to the cripple at Bethesda in John 5, 1 through 15 that made him stand up and was well. It is his word, and it's not simply listening with our physical ears. It is hearing with faith, hearing with love, hearing with a heart ready to do God's will. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's the kind of faith that he's talking about here. A faith that is transforming. It's not intellectual hearing. It is heart hearing and worship. If you believe in the one who sent me, you will have eternal life. It's not enough to simply say I'm a Christian or join a church or walk an aisle or even take the Lord's table this morning. It's not enough to do some religious act as a kid. You have to have a heart that has met God through his son Jesus. You have to have a personal, good relationship with God by his son Jesus and believe on his son Jesus. And here's the great news. There is no judgment. There is no condemnation. Some of you feel terrible today. You feel guilt. You feel burden. You know you're not good enough for God. And that's a good thing that you know that. That's the start of hope because when you realize you're helpless, that's when God helps you, right? And so here... We are told, if you believe in him who sent me, you have eternal life. Not you will have, but presently, today, this is the perfect tense, you have eternal life. Your sins have been removed. They have been taken away, blotted out of God's book by Jesus' blood. You have been justified, pardoned, forgiven. You have a new life. You have hope in you when everyone else has no hope. You have not only eternal life in heaven one day, you have the living God with you today inside of you, keeping you, using you. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. You are united to his death. You are united to his resurrection. You are his child and alive just as Jesus is alive today. You see, when it says you pass from death to life, it means you've actually changed your residence. You were dead legally in your sins. Now you are alive in Christ. You had a heart that was hard. Hard. You didn't feel for others. Now you have a heart that loves your neighbor as yourself. Before, you were a guilty criminal condemned to die, and now the sentence has been reversed. Jesus has taken that verdict of judgment in hell, and now you are forgiven. You are like the prodigal son. You are dead, and now you are alive in him. So look, this is of utmost importance. Who do you believe Jesus is? What you think of Jesus and who Jesus is inside of you matters greatly. It profits you nothing today if you've come here and you've sang songs and you've read about Jesus if you are not joined to him by faith. And so we take the Lord's table today. This is an invitation to anyone who knows Jesus. If you don't know him, you can call out to him. I didn't say you have to understand everything about what we just read, but you need to call out to him as the living God. He'll forgive you. He will remove your guilt. By grace, he will save you and change you. So would we bow before the Lord in prayer? Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. 
If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.